Director of Operations at the Rhode Island SPCA. How are you, Joe? I'm excellent. How are you? Good. Good to see you once again. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining yeah, us. Thanks for having me. Uh, we haven't seen you in a while because you have been very, very busy, which yeah. is sometimes good, but also not so good of a thing. Um, but we're glad to have you back. And today we're going to talk about some of the new things happening with the RASPCA and some new animal welfare legislation. So over the past month, um, you guys have been pretty busy. There has been uh, some investigations happening, uh, some different cruelty cases, and that has caused some new legislations to be introduced into the state house. So, well, let's start off with you talking to me a little bit about what's been happening over at the RSPC. Um, sure. So you touched on a few things. Uh, we're generally very busy this time of year. Extremes were always busier. You know, when extremely cold, extremely warm. And yes, we had a particular investigation this year involving a number of dogs being left out in the cold uh, that has sparked quite a bit of controversy and has shed some light on current laws and how we can better our laws and expand upon them and you know afford better protection for the animals. So unfortunately, busy, but also good to the fact that um, some new legislation is being introduced. So it was my understanding that Representative Serpa and Senator Lynch Prada introduced this new legislation and it was um, with the help of the RASPCA. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. And, and just to go back to what you just mentioned, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a bad situation to shed light on changes we need to make. So if, if that's the one good thing that comes out of this, um, then we can certainly you know, work on that. So this particular piece of legislation deals with tethering and confinement. And there are some laws in the books that restrict how long a dog can be tethered or confined outdoors. There are some exemptions in that law that's been around for, I think, since 2013. And what's caused the most controversy are the exemptions that certain types of dogs, certain breeds of dogs, or dogs used for a particular purpose should be exempt from the tethering or confinement limitations. Um, Representative Serpa did introduce the bill. Uh, we like the bill. We, we certainly appreciate uh, her being proactive in getting this bill in. We do think it needs a little bit of tweaking. Uh, you know, it, sometimes things look good on paper, yeah. but you know, what we do at the SPC, I mean, we're the enforcement division, so we know how these things can be enforced out, uh, you know, in the real world. So we look at that and we would like to make it a little bit better. And like I said, we appreciate the efforts that they put forth, um, but since this bill has been introduced, myself, the state veterinarian, the director of the Potter League down in Middletown, representatives from the animal control community have all kind of gotten together and looked at this bill and said, well, this is good, but how can we make it great? Because we figured if we're gonna go at it, let's go at it you know, the right way and try to get it right the first time around. Um, so we've spent several hours just kind of going through this bill and putting together what we, uh, our version that we think would, would be, you know, a little bit better, more enforceable, and kind of cover a, a, a variety of things in addition to what they've recommended. So um, what we're hoping to do is maybe have a meeting with Representative Serper uh, in, Senate, in, in Lynch Prada and uh, present them with our recommendations. Maybe we can get them to put some type of amendment into this bill before it actually goes for a hearing. Okay, yeah. so what are some of those tweaks that you think need to be looked at? Because from my understanding is that these cases that were, um, that you were dealing with in late December, I believe it was, um, you got a lot of phone calls, mm -hmm. you got a lot of social sure. media messages, there was a big response and and people might were looking at the law and there were kind of like loopholes. Sure. And so, um, you know, I think people need to understand that there are, you can really only enforce the law as the way it is on the book. So maybe we can talk out, you know, because you have these agencies, these bodies that are getting together, uh, you want to be able to enforce the law as it's written, so why not right. help write the right. law? Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> couldn't really keep up with the volume of calls we were getting. And, and we made uh, a number of visits out to that particular location where people were concerned about the, the dogs there and explained to them that, you know, we were doing everything we could within the parameters of the law, um, you know, and if, if you're not happy with that, then we encourage people to, you know, promote change. Um, so particularly, again, as I stated, the, the, the issue we had there was those particular dogs kind of fell within that loophole of the statute. And the statute generally talks about how long you can tether a dog outside. Some exemptions being dogs that are used for hunting. 
and it's very vague. You know, it, it doesn't really say what the the owner has to produce to provide evidence that they're using the dogs for those particular purposes. You see it more with beagles and, and spaniels. Like those are the breeds that you normally uh, uh, associate with hunting. Mm -hmm. Pit bull type dogs, not generally, but they have been known to be used for certain types of hunting. Okay. Um, and this particular individual, you know, has claimed this exemption. He had presented reasonable evidence that those dogs were in fact being used for, for that purpose. Um, hence, you know, putting him in that particular loophole. So the bill, basically what they did was they just took that hunting exemption. There's also an exemption in there for uh, sled dogs, which we really don't have much of in, in Rhode Island. Um, and the bill o omits uh, those two exemptions. So going forward, they're saying, well, those dogs used for hunting uh, or sled dogs shall no longer be exempt. And I, and I think that focuses on the immediate issue, but looking at, you know, other things, um, you know, it doesn't talk about, th there are some people who are legit, who legitimately use those dogs for that purpose. Oh, yeah. And we do believe that their certain exemptions should be okay. Um, but we've kind of expanded on certain things with the tether, like it doesn't address the weight of the tether. And it just says a dog can't be tethered for more than 10 hours. Now these dogs that we were dealing with in Warwick, um, if you looked at them, they had very heavy chains around their necks and that was very upsetting to people. Yeah. Um, but unless we could prove that there was some immediate detriment to their, their well-being, we really couldn't do anything about it. So we modeled Massachusetts and Massachusetts um, has a, a certain percentage of the dog's weight that the tether can be no longer, uh, no heavier than, I think it's, and no quote in this, I think it's an eighth of the total body weight. Oh, okay. So we'll be addressing things like that, um, addressing certain things like extreme conditions. And this all happened when we were talking single digits yeah. below zero. Um, and there are some laws in the books that incorporate weather, but they really don't get into, you know, what happens when you have these extreme weather advisories. So we looked at, again, some other states, and it's always good to look at surrounding states to see what they did. They, they set a precedent, and there were a number of uh, states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Maine, Pennsylvania, that all talk about uh, weather advisories. Oh, okay. And basically saying that during any weather advisory issued by local, state, federal, that dogs are not allowed to be tethered under any circumstances. So even those dogs that may be used for hunting or may be acclimated, recognizing that under extreme conditions it could be potentially you know unsafe for them so we, we kind of looked at adding some language in regards to that um, you know a few other modifications here and there but just trying to take in to account all the potential circumstances that could come up so next time and, and, and I say hopefully it doesn't it's gonna happen again you know hopefully what when it does happen again the law will be in place and it will cover every possible you hope you know every possible loophole so we can enforce it and you know we want people to be satisfied with the work we do mm -hmm. and we want people to know that i mean we're the rhode island spca I mean, we have a genuine care for the welfare of the animals in the state of rhode island we're all very passionate about what we do and and we feel badly when people see these situations and it reflects poorly on us they just assume we're not doing our job we're doing the best we can under the circumstances so we're really going at this legislation. It's it's our number one uh, item on our agenda for legislation this year, and we really want to see this uh, this go through. Okay, so we'll keep updated on that. I'll keep I'll keep tabs on you. Yeah, <laughs> we'll absolutely. keep tabs yeah, on the sure. state house. Absolutely, keep tabs on the state house yeah. as well. Um, but this isn't your only. You, you just mentioned this is kind of number one on the list, but it's not your only kind of hopeful for legislation as well. Um, talk to us about, you know, I kind of just took a deep dive onto Craigslist a moment ago to kind of prepare for this. Sure. Um, I, if you're an animal lover, I highly suggest you don't do it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's been a concern of the RASPCA. Um, talk to us a little bit about some legislation that, you, that you're kind of looking at moving forward with as sure. well. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at, and it's still in the works where we're trying to formulate some language Again, looking at other states, there are a number yeah. of other states that have set a precedence in this regard. We have a huge problem with the underage sale of puppies. And it's not pet stores, you know, that's a whole separate issue, but the puppies you find in pet stores, they're generally eight plus weeks of age. Um, it's the private parties, and most of them you find on Craigslist, you know, that are selling puppies at 
I mean, we've seen them as young as two or three weeks old. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, it, and, two and, weeks? Yeah, oh. and um, people will buy them. I mean, that's the unfortunate thing, but we get a lot of calls. Again, a lot wow. of calls and complaints. Hey, I'm on Craigslist. I saw this ad. They're advertising two week old puppies, four week old puppies. They're, you know, they're bottle feeding them. They're not weaned from their mom. And we have to explain to them that currently in Rhode Island, there are no laws that uh, deal with the minimum age uh, for sale of puppies. Um, so as long as, you know, if you have a, a two week old puppy that you want to sell and the person you're selling it to is going to bottle feed it and they're going to provide adequate nutrition because the law does require that, then it's not illegal. The reality is there's a very small percentage of people out there that I would say have the knowledge and are qualified to <laughs> bottle feed and care for a puppy <laughs> for that age. But legally, we can't assume anything. We can't assume they yeah. don't. We can only act, you know, if there's evidence that they're not doing that. So, um, again, we're looking at some language. Most other states, they either use particular ages. Seven to eight weeks seems to be the range. And that's generally when most dogs will be weaned from, from their mom. Um, other states will use that particular language, seven or eight weeks of age, or when the puppy is sufficiently weaned. Uh, so we're considering a couple of different options right now, yeah. but uh, another big uh, volume complaint that we get that, again, we want to address legislatively so when people call, we can take action instead of saying, you know, I'm sorry, I wish we could, but we can't. Okay, yeah. all right, so we'll keep tabs on that as well. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's talk about maybe something a little more exciting and fun. Um, you guys are opening up new hours. You're gonna be open on Sunday. Correct. So that's exciting. Yeah. And the, um, expanding the cat room? Yeah, oh yeah, we got a lot a lot of uh, fun and exciting things going on. So the cool. Sunday hours, yeah, we're gonna be open uh, starting February 4th. We know it's Super Bowl Sunday. But we'll, That's we'll, fine. This, it will be closed <laughs> before the Super Bowl starts. Um, our hours on Sunday will be 10 to 3. Cool. And we again, we, we're open Monday through Saturday. Our Saturdays tend to be very busy because Monday through Friday, we're only open 10 to 4.30. Saturdays so the, are so busy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, a lot of people work Monday through Friday, so the only time they can come in is on a Saturday. We're currently not open evening hours. That might be something we move towards, but we're hoping that by being open on Sundays, we'll be able to accommodate more people who work that Monday through Friday, um, you know, generate more interest, be able to move animals out more quickly, which is obviously one of our, our big goals. So yeah, we're hoping uh, that it proves beneficial and I'm, I'm pretty confident that it will. Great. Yeah. Well, that's always exciting when you can offer more hours and I know from volunteering um, at shelters that Saturdays are always very busy. Yeah. So yeah, sure. people are always excited to come in Absolutely. and visit. Um, so congratulations on that and Thank congratulations you. on expanding the cat room too. And yeah, the that. Cat, yeah, that's the other. We're getting very close to being done with our addition. Um, our cat room, uh, unfortunately we have our, you know, we have our limitations. The cats are generally confined to their enclosures. We don't have what you would call a community cat room or socialization room for the cats. So this addition is it's roughly 15 by 15. You know, we'd love it to be bigger, but we're limited on space. And it's going to be uh, a community cat room where cats can go in collectively. They can socialize. We're hoping to put some really fun and cool enrichment things in there for them to climb on and. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting. We're looking forward to it. That's good. Yeah. So we'll end on positive notes. Okay. <laughs> so good, we'll yeah. keep it with that. Joe, thank you so much. Um, and let us know what, uh, what else is new uh, as we move forward. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you yeah, so much for joining for us here us. today. All right, everyone, we're going to get set up here for our next guest on Go Local Life. Hang tight.